Good evening. I'm Safa Zaki, president of the college. I'm pleased to welcome so many of you for this important discussion about and in support of our graduate, Evan Gershkovich of class of 2014. As we gather here this evening, it is the middle of the night in Moscow, where Evan is jailed in Lefortovo prison, a sprawling and notorious facility in the city's eastern outskirts. This is a prison known for the isolation and harsh conditions imposed on its in inmates. We are told that, all, that through all that he has endured, Evan has remained remarkably strong. According to his captors, Evan is an American spy. If convicted, he faces up to 20 years in a Russian penal colony. Evan and his employer, the Wall Street Journal, vehemently deny the charges made against him. An accomplished and credentialed journalist, Evan was simply doing his job. Last month, Evan's attorneys asked the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention to issue a statement in support of Evan. His lawyers wrote, and I quote, Russia is not imprisoning Gershkovich because it, it legi legitimately believes its absurd claim that he's an American spy. Instead, Russian President Vladimir Putin is using Gershkovich as a pawn, holding him hostage in order to gain leverage over and extract a ransom from the United States, just as he has done with other American citizens whom he has wrongfully detained." End quote. What is happening to Evan is part of a pattern of criminaliz criminalization of journalism. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, as of their annual count last December, Evan is one of 363 journalists imprisoned in more than 30 countries. Tonight, 180 days into Evan's wrongful detention, we hold him and his family in our hearts. We gather to hear from those who know him, both from his time at Bowdoin and through his career as a journalist, to talk about the challenges journalists face every day and to highlight the ongoing struggle for press freedom in much of the world. Before I introduce our moderator for tonight's discussion, we have a short video about Evan, his very difficult circumstances, and the ongoing coverage of his flight by the news media. It was produced by his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal. American journalist Evan Gershkovich is right now in Russian custody. The U.S. State Department formally declared Evan Gershkovich, quote, wrongfully detained. Americans should be deeply concerned about what's happening. 100 days in Russian captivity. This was the cover of the Wall yeah. Street Journal today. His family is asking for a global effort to get him home. There's no evidence for the charges. His colleagues at the Journal are promoting the hashtag, I stand with Evan, across social media. Nothing that might even be taken as a sign of dissent is allowed in Russia right now. Well, it was obviously very disturbing to see Evan in a glass cage just for doing his job, just for reporting. Evan is a, an all-American boy. Happy birthday to you. Very, very curious from early age. He always had uh, questions about uh, had questions about everything. It's kind of boring to be a reporter. I know that he felt like it was his duty to report. We condemn the detention of Mr. Gerskovich in the strongest terms. Evan went to report in Russia to shed light on the darkness. Evan's incarceration is an assault on free press. Evan was doing what reporters do. We have missed his reporting and authoritative insights into Russia at such a crucial time. Evan is innocent. If this can happen to my brother, it can happen to any journalist. Our message to Evan is this, keep the faith. We won't stop until you are home. I rely on President Biden's promise to do whatever it takes to bring Evan back. Our, moder our moderator tonight is Bowdoin Professor of Government and Asian Studies, Henry, Henry Lawrence. Dr. Lawrence researches media and politics and has written extensively about press freedom, 
government interference, and journalistic independence in Britain, Japan, and the United States. He has served as a research affiliate at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University, and his latest book is titled The Politics of Public Broadcasting in Britain and Japan, the BBC and NHK Compared. The title of our event and the message we seek to underscore tonight is that journalism is not a crime. Please join me in welcoming Professor Henry, Henry Lawrence, who will introduce our panel, lead the discussion, and field your questions and comments. Thanks, Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, President Saki. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we have, as, as you see, three panelists. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce them, and then I will ask them to talk a little bit about how they knew Evan. Um, and so starting um, at the far end, we have Paul Beckett, who grew up in Scotland and went to Edinburgh University. Uh, he then worked for Dow Jones, where I learned today that he was a... Uh, uh, the, the person that wrote the newsletter for the Michigan Tow Truck Association <laughs> for several years as his start in, in, in hardcore local journalism. Um, he has lived and reported in London, New York, Mexico City, Hong Kong, and New Delhi, where he and his team won the Overseas Press Club Award for India coverage, and where he co-authored the book Crimes Against Women, Three Tragedies and a Call for Reform in India. Uh, he is currently the Washington Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. Please welcome Paul Beckett. <laughs> next, next to him is Brock Clark, who will be familiar with many of you, uh, the Leroy Greeson Professor of English here at Bowdoin. He graduated from Dixon College and is the author of several absolutely hilarious novels, which are also, like the author, deeply thoughtful and, unlike the author, somewhat disturbing. Um, <laughs> His novels include The Arsonist's Guide to Writers' Homes in New England and The Happiest People on Earth. He's also a prolific essayist and a short story writer and generally a great storyteller. Uh, he taught over Evan, as he will tell you, uh, and at Bowdoin he teaches, among, else, among much else, courses in creative writing. Please welcome Brock Clark. Finally is Linda Kinsler. Uh, she is a prolific non-fiction writer uh, and currently the editor of The Dial magazine. She graduated from Bowdoin in 2013, where she was an English major and editor-in-chief of The Orient. She won a Marshall Scholarship to study Russian and Eastern European studies at Cambridge University and has written for just about every major publication I can think of, including The Economist, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, Jewish Currents, her book, Come to This Court and Cry, uh, is a fabulous account of war and memory and won the prestigious Whiting Award for nonfiction for up-and-coming up and nonfiction writers. And Dr. Kinsler was awarded her PhD in rhetoric from Berkeley just last month. Undoubtedly, however, the achievement about which she is probably most proud is the A I hope I gave her for global <laughs> media and politics back in 2012. Please welcome Linda Kinsler. <laughs> so uh, we can now move back the other way um, in chronological order, as it were. Um, I'd like to hear from each of you about how you knew Evan, um, some stories about him, what he was like as a friend, a classmate, a student, a colleague, most of all as a writer and as a journalist and as a person. So I will start with Linda and yeah. share some stories, please. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you all for being here to support Evan. It really means the world to have everyone here uh, and you know, we're all here for him so that he knows that we're here supporting him and getting the word out about his case. Um, I feel very lucky to know Evan both as a friend and as a journalistic colleague. I you know, remember very distinctly overhearing him talking to his parents on the quad when we were students. Uh, he was on his cell phone and he was speaking in Russian. 
And I, you know, immediately when he hung up, went up to him and we started talking and it turned out both of our parents are Soviet immigrants to the United States and we, you know, automatically realizing we had this shared background kind of meant that we understood each other very quickly. Um, and it also helped that we were in kind of the same big group of friends here at Bowdoin uh, and that he was one of our beloved writers for the Bowdoin Orient. Uh, I don't know how many of you have looked back at the archives, but there are some really great Evan gems from during and after his time at the college. Um, and after he graduated, he you know, really wanted to be a reporter on the ground abroad, and we were in quite close touch in those years as he was kind of trying to make his path out in the world. And um, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, so, so thank you for coming. It's really great to see all of you here. It means a lot to all of us, and I know to Evan also. I also want to point out that Linda did not take a single creative writing class here. So uh, <laughs> it's just, I don't understand how this has happened. Uh, imagine what would have happened if you had taken creative writing classes, yeah. Uh, so Evan was a student of mine in um, spring 2000, sorry, fall 2013, an introductory uh, fiction writing workshop. And then he took the advanced fiction workshop in the spring of 2014. Uh, and so I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because I think it says a lot about what kind of person he was. So for way too long a time uh, and way too much in the middle of the semester, I was referring to Evan as Ethan. For, <laughs> it was longer than a class, but shorter than, say, two weeks, three weeks. Uh, and when I finally realized what I had done, like when you do something wrong, then you get mad at the person who has made it possible for you to do the wrong thing for so long. I said to Evan, why didn't you tell me that I was getting your name wrong? And he just smirked at me and said, I knew you'd get it right eventually. Uh, and, and that to me says a lot about the kind of person he is. He's got a good sense of humor, uh, and he's incredibly patient. And this seemed to me one of the hallmarks of him as an undergraduate writer here, and then especially in his work as a journalist. So you can tell, reading his work for the journal, uh, where he's very patient with his subjects. He listens to them. Um, he wants to hear what they have to say, and this was always how I viewed him as a student also. Something he was good at when he was 20, and he's gotten expert at it over the next 10 years. So. Um, Evan is one of a small band of reporters who dedicated their careers to covering Russia, and uh, that wasn't always a popular choice. Um, I've been a foreign correspondent long enough to know that if you wanted to get, in, get ahead in foreign correspondency in the 1990s, you took Japanese. And if you wanted to get ahead in the 2000s, you took Chinese. And it took a special kind of dedicated reporter uh, to want to dedicate uh, himself to writing about a country that until really February 22nd of last year uh, wasn't squarely on the radar of uh, American interests or American publications. Um, he was uniquely qualified to do that uh, because of his heritage. He was a son, or his a son, of uh, Russian Soviet era Jewish emigres who moved to New York. He was born in New Jersey. He grew up in Princeton. He was a captain of the Princeton High School soccer team. Uh, and then I'm sure life blossomed for him magnificently when he came to Bowdoin. Uh, and after that, he took all that he knew about his language and heritage and went back to Russia. So rather amazingly, considering that for the last six months he has been front and center in our thoughts, I've never met him. A lot of people at the Wall Street Journal have never met him. But his work stands out for the kind of reporter that he was when he got there, and I know uh, from learning a tremendous amount about him in the last six months, that unlike some foreign correspondents who move to a country and hang out with diplomats and international business people and try and get as close to the powerful as they can, but really don't have much affinity for the people that they're covering, he had a tremendous, has a tremendous, had when he was reporting, love of Russia, which meant that he would go out and listen to Russian punk bands and he would go and play on Russian soccer teams. And it comes through in his reporting. He was working uh, in Russia first for the Moscow Times and then for AFP. And then uh, he joined the Wall Street Journal in December of uh, 2021. So just a few months before the Ukraine war. And he went back very frequently to Russia 
to report, and you could tell from the social stories that he lights it on, the sort of reporter that he was. One that springs to mind in particular is a very moving story he did about Russian families uh, retrieving the corpses of their fallen soldiers in Ukraine. And nobody really uh, pays a huge amount of attention, attention to Russian casualties in Ukraine aside from the numbers. But he did, and he went to the places where those bodies were being brought back and wrote extraordinarily moving stories about it. So uh, it won't surprise you to know that I feel like I know him now, uh, and I'm looking forward very much to meeting him as soon as he comes home. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask one of the panel if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the context of why he was detained. We know something about what was he doing when he was there. Um, why was he detained? How, had, how have we come to this point from when he was filing these amazing stories in Russia? Uh, he was reporting in Russia for us. He was a long way from the capital. He's in Yekaterinburg, and he was re out reporting for the Wall Street Journal. I will stress he was reporting only for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and he had been doing stories on the economy of Russia as it had uh, been impacted by the huge raft of sanctions that the United States put on. Uh, it, after the start of the war, uh, he'd been reporting on the people of Russia. He was doing what foreign correspondents do, which is getting out in the field and talking to people and synthesizing and reporting and writing that back for uh, really, obviously, the Wall Street Journal audience, but for a global audience because there are precious few insights that we get into a country as important as Russia. And he was one of the reporters on the front lines doing that. He was out reporting uh, for us, and then he was um, pulled out of a restaurant where he was meeting by the security services with his jacket over his head. And the next we saw of him was when he was just outside the fort of a prison. And that was the first confirmation that we had that he was alive, was when we saw him being trundled into jail. And so what, what is he being charged with specifically? What's the state of play? I understand he's being held in pretrial detention. Uh, he's launched appeals. They've been turned down. What's been, what's been happening? Well, as we all know, and I know that Evan is very dear to many people uh, in this room who are also following his case quite closely, uh, he's been charged with uh, espionage, which we all know are kind of trumped up charges. He's the first American journalist to be detained in Russia since the Cold War. Um, and, you know, these glimpses, most recently, last week, we got a glimpse of him uh, at one of his many appeals hearings. And, you know, those glimpses are so heartbreaking because obviously we don't want him to be in the situation that he's in, but at least we get a glimpse of him just to kind of see how he's doing, see how his health is. Um, but those uh, moments are really difficult precisely because it involves knowing the intricacies of the Russian legal system. He's had met multiple appeals. In this case, it was kicked back down to the court from which it came from, and so there's going to be more. And the only upside is that maybe we'll get another chance to see him again soon and uh, maybe you all saw, you know, he, he's aware, he, as a journalist, he was covering many of these similar proceedings of Russian journalists. Uh, I had, I was at one point reporting on the detentions of Russian journalists and he very helpfully kind of pointed me to uh, individuals whose relatives had been locked up and so he's extremely aware of the risks and of the realities uh, of how these things work. Um, and so, you know, occasionally we get to see him crack a smile and, you know, that is a little bit helpful. Yeah, those are hard images, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And his family have had chances to meet him, I understand. It must be very difficult for them. Yeah, I know, Paul, you've talked to the family a lot. They have gone to a couple of these hearings uh, in Moscow. I think it's... Uh, probably as heartbreaking as it is heartwarming, but um, it's meant a lot to them to be in his presence, uh, even for a small period of time before they have to come back. Yeah. And can I then ask, um, what steps are being taken? L let's break this down into by the government, by his employer, by his friends, by uh, you know, 
by other parties. Um, what, 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 what's afoot to be able to, to bring him home? Yeah, I mean, I can speak for the friends, you know, very quickly, uh, really, the morning that his face was all over the newspapers around the world, uh, all of his friends got in touch, you know, text message, SMS, DM, everything. Everyone was kind of freaking out, frankly, not knowing what was going on or what the situation is, and certainly not immediately what we could do. Um, and his friends in Moscow, or actually, you know, now all of them are in exile in various places, uh, in Berlin and Tbilisi, they were, you know, hours ahead of us, and so they already had organized, they had a group going. Unfortunately, they had personal experience with what happens to individuals when they are detained in Lefortovo. So uh, it was thanks to the efforts of Ksenia Mironova, whose fiance, Ivan Safronov, is a former Russian journalist who uh, is now facing a penalty of 20 years. Uh, Ksenia, they had just gotten engaged when uh, Ivan was detained and she was 22 years old and she had to learn, she was in the Fortovo for two years, she had to really quickly learn exactly what happens to someone when they are taken to that prison, how do you communicate with them, you know, there's, a, there's all these limitations about what you can send to them and the frequency, uh, and so we were very lucky to have her expertise uh, m mobilizing us and kind of making very clear what can and cannot be sent, and because it's very important in those first days to get him supplies. Um, so it was great that we were able to do that. And uh, then we kind of just coordinated with the people in the United States and the people abroad to have a kind of Evan campaign and get the word out about his detention and kind of keep the pressure on all parties involved since then. So, yeah. I think the, um one of the most uh, uplifting pieces of all this rather grim situation for us has been the support that we have received from Evan's friends, from other journalistic institutions, from Bowdoin and other uh, places that Evan uh, cherishes. And that's been a silver lining to what has been, uh, f frankly, a, a very stressful and uh, six month grind to make sure that his case remains top of mind uh, for the people who will ultimately do the negotiation that we hope will bring him up. Um, you know, we have um, something like this happens, you have to, it's a lot of triage obviously, but the, you sort yourselves into lanes of, for us as a news organization, you have to cover yourself and your own reporter, which uh, it has its own challenges. You have to be an advocate for your colleague and employee. Uh, you have to be government relations experts because ultimately it will be up to the, it is up to the U.S. government to bring him home. And you have to be aware of the broader community that cares deeply about Evan's fate and make sure that everybody is rowing in the same direction. So uh, I think we've 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 done we've done what we can. Um, I think we've done. Uh, you know, there's not many organizations have to go through this, so we're feeling our way some. But the organizations that have gone through similar things have been very helpful in giving us pointers and um, suggesting ways in which we might create the conditions by which this is resolved. The Wall Street Journal is not in a position to negotiate over this. That's a job for the US government. Uh, but what everyone can help with is create the conditions in which the kind of hard-nosed negotiation over between governments uh, can take place. Uh, and that's what we appreciate really everybody's help with, including everybody here tonight. Uh, for showing up and taking an interest in him and it's something we just have to keep going until it's done and we don't know how long that will be. Um, the only other person, the only other American in uh, Russia who has been accused of the same crime is Paul Whelan. Uh, it was 15 months uh, through his pretrial detention and trial until he was convicted. Uh, and he has been there going on five years.
So we're certainly hopeful that it will be resolved long before that, but that is the most analogous case to Evans, and we're just doing everything we can to shorten that kind of timeline to make sure it comes home safe. I just want to add, uh, it's just rem remarkable the number of places who've contacted a bunch of us, uh, news organizations. I just talked to someone from Nairobi, from the BBC, not that long ago, wanted to do a piece on Evan. Uh, and so I, I think part of our job is to constantly, this is what my panelists have been saying, constantly keep his name uh, in people's ears uh, and in the conversation. I've had so many people who have no connection to Bowdoin or to Russia, Russia or to Evan or really any of us who've asked me about it. And I think that's a lot to do with the work that Linda's done and what the journal's done, keeping his name out there. So please keep doing that. In, in the meantime, can I ask what kind of conditions is he being kept in? Can, do, do, how much is he aware of what's going on in the outside world? Can, can we communicate with him? What's it like for him? Do we know? I mean, it's he is able to, you know, occasionally get news from the outside world, and some of us have been lucky enough to get letters back from him. You know, I'm sure you all are aware of there's a letter writing campaign to Evan, so he does get those letters, and uh, he can respond. And unfortunately, everything has to be uh, s translated uh, into Russian so that the prison censors can read it on both ends, and so there is kind of a line of communication, and so it's been really great to just be able to keep him up to date about what's going on in the outside world, but also in his friends' lives, obviously. You know, when he does get out, we don't want him to have, you know, an indefinite amount of time to catch up on, so we're trying to keep him in the loop as much as he can, as we can, and, uh, you know, give little bits of gossip about, uh, his world and, you know, everything that's kind of going on. He made friends wherever he went, so that means he has a lot of uh, gossip to receive. So I hope he's been enjoying that. And also, you know, we can send him books, which has been really lovely. Uh, he got a signed edition of David Grant's The Wager. Um, so there, we're just, you know, trying to do everything we can to make his life better uh, in these horrible circumstances. We have Dow Jones, which is the company that owns the journal, has lawyers in Russia, and they, to their great credit, uh, took the case because in that, that's a tough uh, assignment for them, and they've been able to see him um, once a week or so. Uh, he's had uh, at least two, maybe three uh, visits from the U.S. ambassador in Russia. Uh, usually uh, far longer stretches than we or the American government would have liked, uh, but they do eventually happen. So um, overall, I think his health seems to be good. Um, he's, a, he's a robust Bowdoin graduate, so he won't, not to be intimidated by anybody, I'm sure. But he, um, you know, that's all under the circumstances, and the circumstances are it's a maximum security, security services prison in the middle of Moscow. And I really want to underscore that it's because of this, a lot of the friends that he made while he was in Moscow and people who became uh, really important to him socially and professionally who know how to navigate the system, that they have been able to kind of know, first of all, how to send him things, what to send him, what's important. Um, and so I think, I know he's really, really grateful for that. Thanks. Um, before we move on from this, actually, Paul, I would, I'd love to hear from you again the story you told earlier today about what it was like in the newsroom when the news filtered through or came through. As, as, you know, as someone that studies journalism and media, that must have been a very profoundly sort of intense moment. Uh, yes, yes, uh, March 26th. Uh, um, and... Uh, I was at one of those rather interminable dinners in Washington um, and with a visiting CEO and uh, my phone went and it was Emma Tucker who had just started as the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so I picked up the phone and she said, uh, Evan Gershkovitz is missing. And we think the security services have him. Yeah, there's no, you know, what do you do next? Well. As a journalist, I suppose all of us would um, just start making calls. So that night, uh, we got on the phone to the State Department, to the National Security Council, to uh, we even 
called um, Mark Milley. I don't know what we expected the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to do exactly, but um, we did just call around and send up as many flares as you possibly can so that the government knows that we are taking this incredibly seriously. And uh, to their credit, everybody we contacted was very uh, sympathetic and uh, understood the gravity of the situation. And the next challenge is for us in many ways, um, you know, how much noise do you make? There's a debate in some of these circles as we've since discovered as to, you know, there'll be people say, oh, don't keep the noise down, don't make a big scene because it will only uh, provoke the Russians. Um, we weren't able to do that or even countenance that because a few hours after that, the Russians came out and said that they had taken Evan and accused him of being completely falsely of being a spy. So you really have no option at that point but to go full bore. So it was hugely important to us, first of all, to make sure that the US government would t say publicly that he wasn't a spy. And it was very important to us that the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Mark Warner, would come out publicly and say he's not a spy. Because inevitably, uh, a bit sadly, but inevitably, uh, you know, you get the sort of reaction where people would say, I'm really sorry to hear about your colleague. That's just awful. Just awful. But he was a spy. And you think, okay, we have to put this to bed once and for all and do everything you possibly can to tell people that he, the only thing he was doing in Russia was reporting for the Wall Street Journal. And it, so we had to be as loud as we could possibly be about the situation, about Evan, and about the fact that he was doing his job and only his job and his only job was for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so that occupied uh, just a, you know, that's just a full court press to um, combat what the Russians were saying. You wind up, you feel you're in a sort of propaganda war. Uh, so it's their propaganda and it's our fact. Uh, so that was very important to make that high profile. The next thing that has to happen in these cases is you have to get the State Department to declare them wrongfully detained. And wrongfully detained, uh, sounds very technical, but it is essentially what you call government hostage taking. Uh, so if you get that wrongful detention order by the State Department, it means, and you have to meet 11 qualifications to do that. We got it very quickly by uh, historical standards. And after that, then that really gives the government extra powers to do whatever it takes to bring someone who's been wrongfully detained home. Um, it's what Paul Whelan has been designated wrongfully detained, Brittany Griner was designated as wrongfully detained. And so it's important to us that we get on that list. Um, the people that will make this happen ultimately uh, get him back. It's a special presidential envoy of hostage affairs, which is part of the State Department, and the National Security Council. Uh, so then we get into a next phase of it where you realize that we are both a news organization and in this case, an advocacy of an organization. And in our view of journalism, those two things don't mix. So you then have to separate out, okay, who's going to be covering the news on this? And if we want other people to be covering the news on this, we have to be better than anybody else covering the news on this, or at least do more of it than anybody else and try and lead the way. And then who's going to be doing the advocacy piece of it. So then you bifurcate into who's running the coverage, and that's got to, got to be coverage to the highest standards of the Wall Street Journal. It can't be, you can't pull your punches. If you know it, you've got to write it. It's a very important to maintain our integrity as we cover our own story. And on the other side, and that chiefly gets to the lawyers who is going to be advocating at the White House, at the State Department, uh, anywhere else we can think of, foreign governments, to uh, see if we can help figure out some sort of way that he could come home, or at the very least, make sure that Evan's 
situation doesn't shuffle down into the bureaucracy. Uh, and so being loud was our only option. Being loud meant that, you know, if we were... <laughs> Is, is that, can anyone hear me, or is that just Paul's mic, or is that? Might just be not the mic up. Yeah. I, ironically, talking about silencing people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I can, oh, maybe, my, no, my mic is on. Uh, I, I mean, I think also to the credit of the people uh, at State and at the NSC who are working on Evan's case, they were right there, I guess, you know, the day after the news broke that he was taken. It just happened, so happened that a lot of his friends from the Moscow press corps were in New York, uh, as were a lot of his close friends from Bowdoin, where they live, and so we were all able to kind of gather and talk to people from the government about what we should be doing, what is helpful, what is not helpful, while everyone was panicking, um, and also try to coordinate with friends uh, about our advocacy efforts, you know, get the website up. I hope all of you have checked it out. Uh, and kind of get the, uh, eventually get the letter writing campaign going. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, reporting in dangerous environments. And as uh, President uh, Zaki referred to, it's become a very, it's becoming a more dangerous place to be a forest con correspondent and a journalist. Um, and I'd love to hear, certainly, Linda, you have reported on some very controversial issues and some very dangerous places. Um, before we get onto that, though, I'm, I'm struck by the sheer courage that Evan must have had to have stayed in Russia after the invasion of the Ukraine, and he, he must have known the danger that he was in, and yet he did it anyway. So I'm wondering if any of you have any experience of stories about him or experiences of him or conversations you've had that might have sort of led you to realize that he would be one of the very, very rare people who would, you know, knowing the dangers, nonetheless put himself in a position where he was going to file the sorts of stories he was filing. I mean, part of that is his deep commitment to all things Russia. I mean, his parents were Russian immigrants, uh, and he talked about it a lot at Bowdoin, uh, and he wrote about it after uh, Bowdoin, before he even started working for the journal. There's this remarkable piece in Hazlitt's about his mother's uh, many Russian superstitions, including one remarkable superstition where she would spit three times uh, to ward off the bad spirits in the house. And uh, the, the essay is remarkable, and it's remarkably funny, and it's remarkably sensitive. Uh, and you can see Evan grappling with his identity, and is also his attachment to a place by way of his parents, and by way of the language which he was really committed to engaging with after college. I mean, he was plenty engaged with it here, but I think afterwards he felt maybe he was losing it a little bit, and so it did not surprise me at all uh, that he took the job in Russia for the journal in the first place. He worked for the Moscow Times before the journal because it, it began to seem as something that was absolutely essential to his sense of self. Um, so it didn't surprise me that he had taken this on. Uh, yeah, because he seemed like he, he was committed to the whole project as a person and as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he was choosing, he got a job with the Pittsburgh paper mm -hmm. and the one at the Moscow Times, and he texted me. He was like, which one should I take? <laughs> and, you know, the Moscow Times is a famous place where journalists kind of get their start, and there's a kind of long tradition of um, really the top four foreign correspondents in the world right now covering the region, starting at the Moscow Times. And so he went there and... Uh, he had so many amazing stories. He did one, maybe you've read it, about the door of Alexei Navalny's campaign office that had been kicked in and sawed off so many times by uh, the security agency who you know, obviously aren't covering up their tracks as they break into the offices. Uh, and honestly, he stayed throughout the pandemic as a correspondent for the Moscow Times, and a lot of what we know about how Russia weathered the pandemic and how they treated it is, is because of his reporting. Uh, which was picked up because it was in English and it was disseminated all over the world. Um, and he, you know, of course, he had so many options to go do something else, and he kept wanting to stay uh, even after, you know, the war in Ukraine first began in 2014. You know, he wanted to be there because that was where the stories were. I remember I had coffee with him right before he left for Russia, before he started uh, the job for the Moscow Times, and I said to him, I mean, it wasn't a Pacific place then, either, and I said, are you sure about this? And he just looked at me and he's like, sure, I'm sure. Uh, and I remember laughing, even though I felt nervous for him, but 
he, he seemed to have no reservations. Yeah. More broadly, what do you think we can do, what is being done to sort of stem this tide of just sort of, you know, it becoming more and more hostile and there becoming fewer and fewer places where journalists can expect to operate without getting harassment or worse? I mean, I think one of the things that um, I'm trying to do and we are doing at the Dial magazine that I edit is to uh, really just drive home the message that journalism will be published no matter what in any circumstances, you know? We, if it, even if it's coming from journalists who are forced into exile away from their home countries, they can still report from afar. Like, it, we can translate things that uh, aren't available in English uh, and just kind of Honestly, journalism is ex expensive and hard work, and the more that we kind of prioritize it as a community and subscribe to magazines that will allow them to send foreign correspondents away safely, um, I think is really important. And also to not take for granted that that kind of reporting is something that we will be receiving. I think right now one of the most heartbreaking things um, about Evan's situation, you know, is that we also don't have the stories that he was working on or that he would have told in the future. You know, There are very, very few people who are left in Russia to chronicle the human rights abuses uh, and kind of expansion of the police state that's going on there right now. Uh, and so now we have to figure out other ways of getting that out. You know, Like there are kinds of records and now we just don't have reporters covering them. We only have primary sources. So. If you think what uh, a role Russia is going to play in American life and interests and place in the world uh, has played in recent years and will play going into the future. And the idea that it's, you know, we know less and less about what's happening there, uh, even less and less about what impact all the things that US and allies are doing uh, to try and uh, discourage Russia's militarism, um, that's a, pretty scary prospect. Uh, the idea of being ignorant about a country that is uh, such a challenge uh, to US interests, I think, is a um, you know, pretty awful state of affairs. Uh, the tough part for the US government is that the countries that do this, and it's chiefly Russia and Iran, uh, but uh, China has become very unfriendly to uh, foreign journalists and Venezuela. Uh, so there's you know, specific countries that do this and they see it as in their interests because they get something in return. Um, and that is just a fact and the US government hates it uh, and is looking for ways to try and deter it because it's hostage taking. I mean, there are, there's obviously in Evan's case and other cases involving journalists, it's about uh, f freedom of the press freedom of speech and the flow of international information. Uh, but there's lots of other people who are just taken because they're effectively hostages. And one of the things that we have proposed, although it's imperfect in its own way, is that there are sanctions that are slapped on as soon as someone's taken and take come off as soon as someone is released. Uh, and that's one way that we would encourage the US government to think about it. Uh, the problem is that most of the countries that do this are already sanctioned to the hilt anyway, so the idea of imposing yet more sanctions, even if they do come off if you act, uh, if you sort of correct error of your ways, uh, has its own issues, but it's, it's very tough because they see the advantage in doing it, and you see the, and it is almost, not always, but it's predominantly Americans that are taken. Did you ever face any of that, Linda, when you were doing your reporting? Well, I, only reported in Ukraine, um, and partly because uh, my mother made it very clear. Uh, <laughs> and even mm -hmm. then, she was not thrilled um, that I was, you know, going back to this world that she had deliberately left behind. And so I really um, feel quite close to the situation that Evan is in. Uh, uh, yeah, and so I made that choice, and I, it was important to me to go to Ukraine specifically to cover it um, at that time. And, you know, I think the situation is changing there really quickly as well. Um, and 
I mean, you know, we have journalists, including like close friends of mine who are embedding with the Ukrainian army and that that's not a safe situation either. Um, and so before I, you know, before I was last there a year ago, um, after the full scale invasion began, you know, it was the first time I had to go back with security and, uh, you know, to know what to do if the sirens go off in the middle of the night and all of that kind of thing that is standard practice for journalists who are in the field in hostile situations. And so everyone is trained, you know, everyone is trained who is going into one of these positions to know what to expect. And Evan, of course, was well aware of the risks, um, which I think, you know, is one of the reasons why he has proven to be so resilient in this situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think we were going to open the uh, thing for questions, unless there's any last comments that the panel had before we open it up for Q&A. While they're setting up the mic, can I sneak in a quick professional question? Um, it's studying journalism you know, for 200 years, it seems to me it has, so much has changed, but many things haven't changed. It's still about essentially people with a pen and paper going out and putting themselves in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, and for all of the sort of high tech gadgetry that seems pretty much like where we still are. Um, am I wrong about that? Does, you know, do, does, do, does, you know, all the high tech equipment we have make it easier to report safely? You know, we like to think we can send a drone overhead and look at what's happening without having to send someone into danger. Is, is that hopelessly naive? I mean, I don't think there's any replacement for the kinds of stories that Evan was doing in Russia, and I think he really loved being there. I think he loved the people. I think he loved hearing their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think, no matter how advanced your technology is, sure, like you can Zoom with someone, um, but you're never going to sit in their home, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're there, so. I agree. I mean, you can get an amazing amount, even from countries like Russia and China now, about customs data or trade, you know, that yeah. well, you can build out a picture statistically of what's happening in a country uh, from overseas. I don't think there's anything that would compare to um, impactful reporting that would, as a reader or viewer or listener, bring it alive to you in a way that you'd remember other than being a foreign correspondent. So the only thing I have to add is I was a journalist for a year after college in upstate New York, which is a really scary place. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember I was at a school board meeting way in the country, and one man was swearing, I thought, at me, but in fact he was swearing at his brother on the other side of me, and I felt <laughs> really happy to be there at that moment. I can only imagine what it's like to be really in harm's way. But yeah, I can't, I can't imagine not being in a place to do the work that you have to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. gadgets or no gadgets. Yeah, and I think, I mean... On that note, I, Evan, love, part of the reason why he loves being around people and he chose to become a reporter is because he loves writing and he's really yeah. dedicated to the craft of writing. And I know it was really meaningful to right. kind of have that training going in and he has it, approaches it with a kind of literary mindset, right? Which, yeah. you know, doesn't lend itself to remote work. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Great, um, so I see the mics have been set up. Um, <laughs> I will ask a couple of things about the questions. Um, so please come up to the mics. Um, we, we would like, if possible, f uh, to allow our students to have first go uh, at asking the questions. We would love to hear from the young people first. So if you could please allow them uh, the opportunity to come. If you'd like to come and form a line for questions, um, and I'll recognize you, please limit yourself to uh, one question, and please keep it short and to the point. Um, and then uh, we'll take the questions. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, thank you for, for hosting such a wonderful session, which is of course very, which is of course very informative and very helpful for us to understand both inside and outside what is going on. So I think that this is a a, a question that I want to reserve for Professor uh, for Professor. Uh, for Professor Lawrence, since you seem to be the most knowledgeable about this, but of course, if, <laughs> if any, <laughs> I'm wondering what this course, is. Uh, now. But of course, this, if any of the panelists have any insight what, on what's this, what's the I'll, question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I want to situate what is going on with with Evan within the larger geopolitical cir cir circumstances that are happening, since 
principles such as freedom of press and freedom of speech are internationally recognized recognized principles that are actively enforced by such as the such as the International Tribunal and the European Union. But given the fact that Russia has been increasingly alienated by these international organizations, I was wondering: Are these will these principles still? Are there still any powers or sources of enforcement of these principles to which Russia? To which Russia may be susceptible, or in the most, in the worst and most unfortunate case, is Russia just completely isolated, that, and that no country in the Western world or in the first world can do anything? That's that's a great question. Speaking, and I can, we can see we have professors of international relations in the audience <laughs> that could speak to the importance of international laws and norms. But I'm going to throw it to the panel. Um, do, do any of these sort of, you know, commitments to free press? mean anything on the ground in practice? No. Uh, and if they are, can we? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, my worst, my worst hopes have come true. <laughs> Lin mean, Linda, give us more hope than that. I, I don't really have hope, but I do think it's a good question, and we're in a really interesting moment when uh, not at all with regards to Evan's case, but you know there is this international effort happening right now to kind of reconfigure the international justice system to one day hold Russia accountable for what it is doing in Ukraine. And so everyone is revisiting the Nuremberg model, trying to see how it can be adapted for the 21st century. There's talk of a special hybrid tribunal for Russia in the future. Uh, which would likely look like a Ukrainian court that would be outside of the borders of Ukraine with international support. And so what the contours of that are, are to be determined, who's on that, what it means, you know, all of these things are kind of like being constructed in real time, so. This is, of course, exactly the subject of your book, mm -hmm. Come to This Court and Try, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. which does not sound optimistic. Um, I don't have for, hope. <laughs> for, those, for those of us, including Professor Clark, who have not read your book, but unlike people like me who have, um, can you summarize for the audience what, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, you know, what, what you drew from the book and the search for justice um, in an anarchic world? Yeah, I mean, the subject of the book is, you know, it's uh, largely set in Riga, Latvia, which is where my family is from. And it's about, you know, kind of the process that's happening right now in Ukraine, very much so, but also in other former Soviet states where they're trying to reconfigure their legal systems to hold people accountable um, in a way that applies to the 21st century. So the case that I was particularly looking at was uh, the assassination of a former Nazi who was killed in Montevideo by Mossad in 1965 and is now posthumously uh, being criminally investigated in Riga. And so it's kind of this uh, opportunity to revisit what Nuremberg taught us and what the kind of great trials of the 20th century, uh, including the Eichmann trial, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, what all of those uh, forums taught us about what justice should look like. And so now all of those precedents are being drawn upon uh, to kind of guide us in how Ukraine should, or in how Russia should be held accountable. Um, and it's really interesting to see that, you know, it's completely unsettled, you know? And in fact, one of the first histories of the Japan tribunals is about to come out. And so mm -hmm. there are all these um, pockets that haven't been explored. And, you know, one of the, not ironies, but fact about the situation is that the term crime of aggression was only uh, one used in Nuremberg to hold the Nazis to account because it was a Soviet uh, judicial invention. And so that is the same crime that this tribunal will be formed to uh, judge. Thanks. Yeah. We have another question. I want to thank uh, the panel and Professor Lawrence. Obviously, this has been a wonderful conversation so far. Uh, you guys mentioned um, how as Russia becomes closed off, it obviously becomes harder and harder to report. So I was wondering, um, as that happens, how do your strategies for reporting change? Are you taking new steps and new ways of trying to gather information um, to so that we still know, so that we, we can still at least attempt to know what's going on uh, inside of Russia and, of course, other countries that are becoming more closed off as well? 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, I hope one at some point we'll be comfortable going back into Russia to report. But in the meantime, um, and the same is largely true of China, uh, where we have a much diminished presence compared to what we had a few years ago. Uh, but our Russia reporters are still on the Russia story. They're just doing it from Warsaw, Berlin, Tbilisi, said Dubai in some cases. So you go and try and report on what the people coming, you know, you talk to people who are coming out of Russia, you call into Russia, you read about what's happening in Russia, you sort of do all the things you can to try and um, come as close as you can to reciprocating what it would be like on the ground. But our China reporters, we have a, a much smaller bureau there now, and we have China reporters, or pe reporters reporting on China in Taipei and Hong Kong and Seoul and Singapore and New York. Uh, and you just have to be creative and keep at it, and they do a fantastic job because uh, they're all dedicated to covering that story. They just have to cover it from outside. I do a stump for also fiction writers. And so if the, the more difficult on the ground reporting uh, is for reporters, for journalists, we, you can turn to fiction writers who can do different things from different contexts and different places. So two in particular, this is the great Russian writer Mikhail Yossel uh, is a wonderful fiction writer and nonfiction writer, often hybrid. And he has a great deal to say about the current conflict. And then this great Ukrainian Canadian fiction writer named Maria Reva, R-E-V-A. Uh, is absolutely brilliant and very funny and very mordant, and I think she, I think Evan would like her work. I'm sure, I'm sure he knows it already. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, and like um, Andrei Kirkov, mm -hmm. the great Ukrainian novelist, who is also very much involved in the uh, kind of civilian effort, and um, I'm sure everyone heard about uh, Victoria Amelina, who was a really up and coming, wonderful Ukrainian writer who was killed. Uh, while she was uh, bringing a group of foreigners to Ukraine to show them around. And so there's, you know, a lot of yeah. prose and poetry writers who are literally soldiers in Ukraine right now, putting their lives on the line um, and writing while they're doing it. And so that's a kind of primary source for us as well. Thank you. Grace. Is there anything that we as individuals can do to help Evan right now? I get a bit karmic about this, to be honest. Um, so just think of him. I mean, I honestly think of our effort as trying to maintain an altitude of interest and awareness on his case and not let that altitude drop. So um, keep him in your thoughts. And think about what it must be like for him. And you're a Bowdoin student. He was a Bowdoin student. Just just think of him and I do honestly believe that that will help. Uh, there are practical steps you can take. Um, if you want to get more familiar with him, there's a huge section and it's free on WSJ.com of his writings that will help you understand uh, him and what he has been writing about. Uh, writing to him, uh, I think, you know, I, the... Uh, Jewish Federations of North America for Rosh Hashanah, I think, sent him about 1,500 letters. So maybe just give him a bit of time. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it was a very impressive uh, letter writing campaign that I think does make a huge difference. Um, it's part of our effort to make sure that members of Congress and Senate uh, are aware and, you know, their calls to the White House on what are you doing and why has it taken so long, are very impactful, and we're keen to keep that as bipartisan as possible, given the sensitivity of the issue. So that's another way to help, uh, and just finding any way, any way in which you can help spread uh, awareness, even if it's a pin, you know, anything, anything that you can do that would just have the occasional person say, who's that guy, and you have the chance to explain and get another supporter behind it. And also talk about his, read his read and talk about his work. Uh, and I think sometimes that maybe that gets lost a little bit. He's a remarkable writer and uh, it's useful. It's rewarding to go back and read the work he was doing from Russia before he was arrested. Um, and then to tell other people about that work and the email them the articles, yeah. Yeah, and also um, he does know, I 
he doesn't know about this event. I did write about it to him in a letter about two months ago. I didn't get one back yet. Um, but this is a good time for me to say that I hope we can take a photograph um, of everyone here before we totally call it a night uh, because we are able to get him some small artifacts and I know it would mean a lot to show him that everyone showed up for him today. So. Thank you. Next question. Um, Mr. Beckett, your organization actually does think that journalism is a crime when uh, they said journalism exposes powerful Americans' crimes. Uh, do you think that your organization's campaign to free Evan uh, would have more meaning if it didn't spend the past 13 years supporting enthusiastically the prosecution of Julian Assange? Yeah, I appreciate where you come from, but I'm here to talk about Evan and not about Julian Assange. You don't see right. any connection between no. the two charges of espionage? I do not. Not in the slightest? No. no. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? I had a question about um, prisoner swaps, which the United States has been using to, to try and get people back who are innocent. Uh, for instance, the one of um, Brittany Griner earlier this year. Um, and obviously it's a guilty person, a, a notorious Russian arms dealer, in exchange for an innocent person, which could be played back in Russia as sort of a, a positive, they've done something good for their, uh, their country in that regard. Does those, are those methods a sort of pragmatic, the only way of getting people back? Or could they be seen potentially as further emboldening Russia as uh, sort of just forcing them to take more and more people? Um, so I think, on the, I think that is a real dilemma. If your question is, does something like a Brittany Griner, Victor Boot swap encourage Russia to take more people? Is that, yes, the, really. that's the danger of it? Uh, I think that's a real danger. And I don't, you know, I think Evan was a, high-profile target as a journalist, but I think he was a hostage. He, it was, you know, they needed to top up the coffers uh, and increase the currency that they had with which to trade. So it is a very, very difficult uh, situation. It's a difficult situation chiefly for the US government. Uh, I know in that case that um, you know, there's a lot of controversy when Brittany Griner was brought out and Paul Whelan was left behind. Uh, the government had both of them on the table for Victor Boot, but the Russians refused to give up Paul Whelan. Uh, and then the US calculation was, is it better to get one person out than two? Oh, sorry, one person than none, even if you can't get two. And so they took one rather than none. But yes, someone who is caught with a vial of hash oil versus someone whose moniker is the merchant of death, uh, it does seem like a, a trade that uh, Russia would benefit from. Uh, and I think they'll keep doing it until the US government finds a way to stop them. Our interest is, is in getting Evan back, but uh, there's a reason that that's, those swaps are controversial and I think you've identified it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, obviously there has been precedent in, in Russia, exa uh, for example, with Anna Politovskaya in 2005. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, do you believe that there is still a place in the world where freedom of press and freedom of speech exists, where we see today, uh, without mentioning specific cases, but for example, in France, uh, the arrest of, uh, of a journalist who was covering um, a potential military intervention of France in Eg Egypt, um, or without talking about Julian Assange, but still in general. So do you still believe that there is freedom of press today anywhere in the world. Um, does it exist? And do you, how do you see it evolve in the foreseeable future? I mean, I hope to never live in a world in which it doesn't exist. I think it's very much still present. Uh, I think in the United States, sometimes we forget how much freedom we have as journalists here, particularly, I mean, I've reported in a lot of other countries and then coming back here and realizing uh, what freedoms are permitted to journalists can be um, quite an adjustment. Uh, and I do, like, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom about journalism all the time. You know, it's a constant state. And there's another way of seeing it, which is that we're in this era where online media is starting to stabilize after the first 10 years where uh, the tech companies kind of, like, changed the models a lot and now we're kind of figuring it out a little bit and there's an incredible amount of independent 
magazines and newspapers that have emerged over the past 10 years uh, who are publishing people in translation. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I edit The Dial is because it's a magazine of international reporting. We're bringing people into English for the first time. We're allowing them to write uh, from the countries that they live in. Uh, and I just think there's a lot of invention going on right now. Um, and as much as we're also seeing the rise of kind of authoritarian states who are driving journalists out, we're also finding new ways to report on them. So. Yeah, I, just as a historian of media, I can say, if you think things are bad now, go back, yeah. <laughs> go back 40 years, even in Britain, in America, anywhere. Um, it's, it's by no means perfect, but I think in, in there are certainly places where there's more freedom than there, there has been in ever. Um, great question, though, thank you. Um, I have a similar question about freedom of the press. Uh, Mr. Beckett, I think Professor Lawrence mentioned you had experience in Hong Kong. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments about the state of journalism in Hong Kong specifically, if the fate of Apple Daily is something that should be uh, seen as a threat in other putatively democ democratic societies. I think our reporting since I left Hong Kong seven years ago would suggest that it has got very, very markedly worse. And I think what's happened with Jimmy Lai and Apple Daily and the uh, repression that has gone on there is exactly what you're talking about. And I think you've seen it, uh, the sorts of um, restrictions on freedom of the press that you took for granted in China, but always hoped that Hong Kong wouldn't succumb to. I just don't think you can say that anymore. Thank you. Question. Hello. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this is for all of you guys. Uh, with American journalism becoming more hostile and a tool for international relational leverage, uh, how do you see domestic journalism changing? Do you see any future of any international level action at this point? For instance, com commissioning a committee with the UN to like communicate with other countries on how journalism, journalistic conditions should be? I, I admire the uh, work of the Special Rapporteurs for Press Freedom at the United Nations. Um, as your, as your uh, colleague's earlier question about are there forums that, that exist where it could bring about meaningful change, I think you know the highest level of all of those is the United Nations Security Council, and I think you've seen that that's become uh, something approaching pantomime when it comes to trying to um, bring Russia to the table and talk about it. I mean, it's sort of become completely deadlocked if you, with Russia and China to some degree and then the, um, the other three. So uh, I, I would be, um, yes, not confident that there is a way that would make that happen if the body that was established to make it happen can't make it happen itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I would first like to say a couple words towards Grace's question regarding what we as individuals can do to support Ivan. And I'll just say support Ukraine since anything that you can do to to show Russia that they're not as all powerful as they for some reason believe they are will go towards the effort of also creating some freedom of press and freeing even specifically. And I was also wondering whether um, I understand that even was primarily writing for the international audience, but still whether the fact that he was covering um, the state of Russia, especially now when their propaganda machine is you know, running all force, whether that could be an aspect of it that perhaps some Russian audience would be susceptible to his journalism and thus get some rebellious ideas that would be incoherent with what the state was dictating, whether that could be uh, a motivator for detaining him or whether we're just looking at that as you know, a high level, whoever they could get their hands on in order to sort of take hostage and get leverage in the US. I mean, I think uh, we cannot speak to the motivations of the people who took him. Uh, but I think there's, he was 
one of the many journalists, including Russian journalists, I think we often don't talk about the work that they were doing. There are independent Russian journalists, and we were just talking about you know, whether journalism has died or not. As those voices have been driven out of the country, they've also re-emerged, and they're continuing to do their work as much as they can. So I don't think uh, you can say that Evan was the only one who was doing this kind of work, and certainly um, there are many Russian language outlets uh, that people can still turn to to find uh, independent news there. Thank you. Yes, oh. and this looks like to be the last question, so oh. go ahead, Bea. God, the pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> You'll be fine. I, I think, I mean, part of why we're here is because you went to Bowdoin, and uh, I think one of the things that has struck me is that contrary to any other story, I've eaten in the dining hall where he's eaten, and uh, I've been in the halls where he has. And so I was wondering if you could perhaps finish the talk by sharing a story of his, or sharing perhaps another personal account that might give us a little bit more of what he was like. It's a good question. Yeah, you mm -hmm. that um, well, there's a great haiku that he wrote uh, <laughs> in the Orient Archives. Um, you know, I think, uh, like, he's just a great guy. I mean, there, you know, at a certain point when you're talking about him, you don't want to be hagiographic, but he's a great guy. He's a great sense of humor. He was great fun at parties. Uh, I loved editing him at the Orient. Um, and I think, you know, you're getting the sense of why everyone wanted to kind of be his friend and remain his friend. Um, and I think that we're all really lucky that he came to this place and that we got a chance to meet him here. So, yeah. Yeah. He's an incredible, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to overlook this, but he was an incredibly funny man. He is an incredibly funny man. Uh, and every time I was going through the, our email correspondences over the last five years, and all of them had belly laughs in them. He would make jokes in them, often at my expense, often at his own expense. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, as one of those people, you were. It's interesting to look back at knowing him when he was 20 and 21, and you can see the things that makes him remarkable now. Uh, there was a lot of joy, uh, in, and not just in his personality, but in his prose too. Um, you can come to my office, and I'm happy to show you the stories he wrote for for my workshop. But uh, they're often not fully put together. Uh, but you know, <laughs> neither are mine. So I think uh, uh, there was even stuff that didn't work. There was so much pleasure in it, uh, and it's still there. All right, that is a great question to end it on. Yeah. So I would like to, uh, well, we need to take the selfie. Sorry, <laughs> Am I right? I have one more question. They took the mics away, but... Uh, no, uh, excuse me. Address, uh, excuse uh, me, sir. No, we, we, are, we, we are out of time. willingness to answer a question about Brittany Griner, a basketball player who taught Sir, we are out of time. I still fail to see the connection, but thank you I, for the I, question. You're, you're All really right. avoiding the question, and I find it cowardly. I'm here to talk about Evan Gerskovich. I'm not here to talk about Julian Assange. I, Our I, colleague has been in, in a Moscow prison for the last six months. That's what everybody here has turned out to listen to. And I, hope, again, we've, to I hope we've given people All right. an illuminating evening. I appreciate yeah, the question. You're a coward and the question. I appreciate your comments. That has done whatever cause you wanted to do, no good at all. Um, we're here to talk about Evan. We would like to take a photograph of the audience. Before we do that, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Please show your appreciation. <laughs> well